The greatest secret of the war comes into the open. From hidden factories over the nation, under heavy army protection, the first atomic bomb was assembled. On the New Mexico desert, Allied scientists unleashed its stupendous power. Army cameras six miles away recorded the historic moment in the black of night. was the end result of two billion dollars spent on research and production, of years of feverish labor to harness atomic power ahead of the enemy. The energy that generates the heat of the sun and operates the solar system comes under the will of humankind. Luminous smoke rises eight miles in the air. From another angle, with the camera aimed above and to the right of the bomb, the same explosion is seen again. This test, the first proof of the atomic bomb's usefulness, was made only 20 days before the Jap base of Hiroshima was blasted from the Earth. Two bombs, the second on Nagasaki, and Japan sued for peace. The blast changes the atomic structure of all substances it contacts. Stone and steel are turned into gas. Still from six miles distance, another picture of the same explosion. In war, atomic power can level an entire nation in a few days. In peace, this incredible energy opens limitless horizons. On the 8th day of August, three days after the one in which the atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima, the Soviet Union declared war on the Japanese Empire. This participation had long been expected by the leaders of the Big Three. In April, at the Yalta Conference, Marshal Stalin assured President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill that following the surrender of Germany, Russia would enter the war in the Pacific. And at that time, it was estimated that it would take three months from VE Day for the Red Army to move the necessary supplies to the Eastern Front. Russia's attack on Japan occurred approximately three months after Germany had been eliminated. Battle seasoned troops, veterans of Stalingrad, and a drive across Europe to Berlin smashed over the Manchurian border and hammered back the crack troops of the Japanese army. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Reporters rush out to relay the news to an anxious world and touch off celebrations throughout the country. Washington is jubilant. And in Chicago, more than a million sing and dance in the streets in the biggest celebration the Windy City has ever seen. Joy is unconfined. It was 4 o'clock Pacific time in San Francisco when the announcement came, and people were quick to leave their offices for an impromptu, spontaneous celebration. But it was in that city's Chinatown, where Victory Day was the most joyous. Firecrackers that had been hoarded for years are set off in a triumphant roar. <laughs> Seattle let loose all the pent-up emotions of three years and eight months of war. And to the victors, the spoils. The pose may not be dignified, but the young lady is not the least upset. Peace, it's wonderful. 
But the greatest, wildest celebration of all was in New York's Times Square, where two million people, by far the greatest in the city's history, filled the streets all day waiting for the official word. A hilarious, happy throng, they cheered every rumor that it was all over. And when President Truman's announcement came at 7 o'clock, the lid really blew off. Tens of thousands of proud American flags dotted the square, and as the day wore on, hilarity reached a high peak. Far into the night, the happy crowd screamed their relief at the end of the greatest war in history. From early Tuesday morning, the celebration went on for 24 hours. New York never celebrated like this before, but never did they have a better reason. On a gray day, September 2nd, 1945, the battleship Missouri steams into Tokyo Bay. On the decks of this giant ship, the document that is to reduce Japan to a fifth-rate power is to be signed. Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, one of the men most responsible for smashing the Japanese hopes for world domination, is piped aboard the Missouri. He is met by Admiral Bull Halsey, the man who translated the brilliant naval strategy of Admirals King and Nimitz into the devastating power that ripped the Jap fleet apart and left its ships lying shattered on the coral reefs and in the deeps of the Pacific Ocean. Now General Douglas MacArthur appears, accompanied by high-ranking officers of the United States Army. General Wainwright, just a few days freed from the blacked-out anonymity of a Japanese prison camp. General Stilwell, who early in the war tracked through the Burma jungles in retreat from the then-victorious Nippanese armies. They passed the uniformed representatives of the Allied powers, Russians, British, Chinese, and cocky-clad American admirals and generals. Over the islands and the atolls of the South Pacific, through sea lanes and across bloody beaches, Nimitz and Halsey guided the destinies of the greatest naval and fleet carrier plane actions in the history of the world. This day is the culmination of their work and of the work of MacArthur, whose troops and planes helped crack Japan into complete submission. Pulling on the ropes and lipping on the wooden leg that he wears as a memento of an assassination attempt in Shanghai years before, Japanese Foreign Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu is helped up the gangway and piped aboard the Missouri. He is followed by the chief of the Imperial General Staff, Yoshijiro Umetsu, and others representing an emperor who ordered his people to lay down their arms and submit to the first defeat in his empire's history. In the latter half of the 19th century, the feudal Japanese embarked on a career of westernization that progressed with bewildering ease. First, they beat the Chinese, and then in 1905, they equipped the Russians. In World War I, they sided with the Allies, furthering their anachronistic attempt to identify themselves with the Western democracies. Then suddenly, they snatched Manchuria, and in 1937, they attacked China, confident that they could grab all Asia. The rising sun of the greater Asia co-prosperity sphere reached its own particular zenith in the few months following Pearl Harbor. Then it was driven back far below the horizon. On the veranda deck of the great battleship, defeated, the Japs stand. And across from them, across the table, upon which lie the documents of surrender, are their conquerors. General MacArthur, Admiral Nimitz, and Admiral Halsey leave the cabin. 